So if a Jewish person eats pork chops, they're Gentile? <laughs> they could be considered such. Right, yes. <laughs> but we won't go there tonight. Tonight, we right. Won't. We, we, won't. We, we soon will be in dietary laws, but we don't have to go there tonight. Many of you, I'm sure probably all around the room, you've heard the expression, the devil's in the details. Uh -huh. Right? Mm -hmm. We've heard that too. Mm -hmm. We've heard it. And it can mean anything from ignore the fine print at your own risk, or it could be pointing out that the details, the small little details, have the biggest reward. Mm -hmm. Details do matter. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to let you know that was not the original thing. Mm -hmm. Just like we changed from go everywhere, we changed it to. The, the good one. <laughs> Do you know originally, and I'm wondering, is everybody hearing me because I'm not hearing well? Okay. Originally, it was God is in the details. Mm -hmm. That's originally how it was. Should we be surprised? No. Uh, no. What does Satan do? Counterfeit. Right. Counterfeit. Counterfeit. Yep. But it actually, the credit goes, if they're right, to a Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Forgive me, German American, and uh, he took it from a German proverb. I have not been taught German, so forgive me, any German speakers in the room. Der Lieb Gott steckt im Detail. God is in the detail. Late 1800s, he was an architect, and architects know how important the details are, do they not? So it fits that he would come up with this from this and understand this, but I loved his main philosophy, and this just means something to me if you all know why, but his philosophy was less is more. Mm -hmm. That was my brother's. Right. <laughs> I don't call my brother a philosopher, and I know he didn't know of Ludwig and, and his view, but it's very interesting as we listen and we look and we think about that. I also like the fact that this gentleman's last name, if we take it into the Hebrew from the Greek, we have Rohat. Rahat. Rahat. Okay. I'll get it right sooner or later. The R O and the H E sound. So the Rash and the Het. Okay? When we put that together, we have what we come off of that with shepherd. Or some will say pasture, and when we put it in the verb form, it's to shepherd or to pastor, and it has the idea of a, a friendship, a communion, a companionship, and intimacy, what God wants with us. Yeah. We don't need everything else. Mm -hmm. Less is more. Mm -hmm. Less is more. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, they use that expression, the devil, in the details, often to, to say that there could be something mysterious something hidden in those details, something that you needed to pay attention to. But it also was said that the truth could be in those details. So you had to know who your source was and whether you were looking for something that they were trying to sneak past you or whether they were really trying to bring you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All I can say is that Satan always takes some twists. So we're going to go to the original. And when we think about the details, it does depend on what you're talking about as to how much it matters. Mm -hmm. And when we come to scripture, the detail matters. Yeah. Yes. That's the bottom line. God is in the details. And why do I bring that to you tonight? If you've been looking at the parsha that we're starting on right now, Tetzavah, you look at details. Detail after detail after detail after detail, and you may wonder, why is all of this here? <laughs> but let me tell you, God is in the details. Yeah. And those details are going to be bringing out to you truth. I can guarantee you that. The Word of God is truth. And it will not only be bringing you out the truth, but it may be pointing you to the one called truth. Mm -hmm. Originally, again, the details were the fine print and how do you understand it, how do you disclose, how do you reveal, how do you explain so that someone isn't caught. If you deal with real estate, you deal with a contract, they have all the disclosures and all these details 
and it may take a scientist to get through it, it may take a magnifying glass, but every detail matters. Ask a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> every detail matters. Ask the architectural team or person, I'm not sure which it is, with the Leaning Tower Pizza. Mm -hmm. Proof positive the details matter. Your foundation matters also. What about a surgeon? What about a painter? Details matter. The details of your plans can make or break your plan. You need to plan your work, and then you need to work your plan. Could it be that God is in the details? That he is bringing truth? That he is speaking to us even in those tiny little details? That he's exposing, I'm going to say it, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you come at scripture with that idea, that thought more than an idea, I think you're going to see. Because there is no fear that 100% of Scripture is truth. Amen. There's no doubt. There's no one who's ever been able to prove the Bible wrong. Those who say, oh, I know the contradictions, ask them to give you one. Mm -hmm. And watch how the Ruch HaKodesh shows you the answer. There is no contradiction. The details can be beautiful. They can paint a whole picture. And again, the attention is given to an oil painting. They look at the fine strokes. They look at the colors. They look at the shadowing. They look at so much. And if you are constructing anything, mm -hmm. you want the details. If you're learning to sew, you need the directions. What about constructing, hmm, a tabernacle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Maybe God's in the details. Mm -hmm. And if you've never gone through a study on the tabernacle, we took months to go through it here. It's rich. There's so much there. I'll hit a few highlights tonight. But the beauty, the truth, it is brought out in 3D living color. Mm -hmm. I'll call it tabernacle color. <laughs> because even the colors yes. are there for a reason. And it's amazing the detail that is there. And whatever you have for your background, you come at scripture with that, whether you are an architect, whether you are a mathematician, whether you're a scientist, it doesn't matter what field you're in. You will see in the scriptures the perfect in your field that will stand in awe and amazement because that's our God. He is the divine architect. He is the great mathematician. When you start looking at the, the mathematical numbers that correlate with our Hebrew letters and you see that in the depths of the scriptures, it can blow your mind. There's one thing that exposes, and that is light. You got it. Yay. <laughs> light does expose. You can't hide the truth in the light. And it's interesting that our, our uh, portion this, month, this week starts with the menorah. It starts with the light. This is the first thing that's talked about in the tabernacle is the menorah. And that's where we start with the command to provide pure oil. Pure oil. And actually, once again, just like last week, it actually says take. Because the idea, again, is that as you give to God, you're going to take more than you're able to give. And anybody who thinks they can outgive God, I'll tell you, try it. <laughs> Just try it. There is no way. That word is truma. That was the name of our parasha last week. And again, this is our God. And as we look at the detail, as we look at oil, we look at the fact that it was olive oil. We look at oil through scripture and we see a picture there. For those who've been in the word of God for some time, you know that it's a picture of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that is bringing that light, that keeps the light going, that brings it into us. And that pure olive oil was to feed an everlasting flame. It had to always be burning. 
It was burning morning, it was burning night. It burned in the light, it burned in the dark, but you didn't see light and dark because it's in the tabernacle in the building, so it, it was the light of the entire building that, that they would see by. And as we see that that light, that oil furnishing that light, we can see and understand that anything we can do is powered by the Ruach HaKodesh. Mm -hmm. In that same way, he lights our fuse and he lights us and he keeps the light burning and he exudes that light from us. At least if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, coming to our God through his Son and allowing his Spirit to work through us. So the detail of the menorah, the light revealing the light of the world, Oh, I could park right there for the whole rest of our night. <laughs> We've talked about the light at Hanukkah. We've talked about the light so many other times. I'm going to let you just let your mind go with the light. And we'll pick that up at other times also. But we're in the details tonight. So we've got to move on from just the first. We have the oil. We have the light continuing. And then right after that, we're given the direction for the priestly garments what the priests were supposed to wear. Do you know how many articles of clothing the priests were to wear? No. Eight or seven. The, the normal priests, if I can use the word normal, put that in quotes, was four. The high priest was eight. Eight articles. And we get the details on these articles. All the company wore four pieces of clothing. They wore a full-length tunic or shirt, short pants, a band of white linen wound in, into the pointed turban, and a long sash above the waist. But the Kongil, the great high priest, added four more on top of that. That he was dressed. He, he had helpers to get him dressed. We've already talked about the fod. We talked about uh, the breastplate that goes on. Uh, the breastplate with the pouch, the breastplate had the 12 uh, stones on it to represent our 12 tribes, but the ephod, the apron-like, that went over the tunic, that was blue, purple, red-dyed wool, linen, and gold thread. And every one of those colors, every detail, is there for a reason. In quick remem remembrance of our study before, blue is heavenly, reminding us where it all comes from, it's heavenly, it's from our God. It is purple, purple is royalty. We are, we are picturing our king who is also our high priest, our Kohen Chedal. We have red dyed wool and red we know. Picture the sacrifice, the blood that was shed, the white linen, white representing the purity, the simpleness, the clarity of it, and the gold thread that ties it all together and shows us the deity of the sacrifice. Not just 100% human, which he was and is, but 100% God mm -hmm. at the same time. Do we understand that? Mm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the closest we get is we look at ourselves and we see that we can have a person in several roles. We can have a mom who is a wife, who is a sister. We can have a husband who is a father, who is a brother. We see in that an idea that gives us. But where we're one person trying to play those roles, Yeshua was fully both mm -hmm. and yet in one. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, if you can understand how God created out of nothing, then maybe you can understand this too. And if you can understand how God always was, and what was he doing back there in the was, <laughs> and it will always be, maybe you can begin to understand. Let your mind go, let it explode, but see the detail, because the detail's there for a reason. The breastplate, the 12 stones, we went into that before also. It had the Urim and the Thummim in it where they would be, in our Hebrew, the best we can come up with is lights and perfections that in some way it would light up, that would give an answer to a question that the high priest had before God regarding the people. The stones alone, just taking the first stone, and even though your, your uh, version gave a different word, I don't remember it now, but... Ruby also is the name for that first stone. The first stone in color is red. 
<coughs> Ruby Red, I'll put it that way. And the first stone represented the first son, Reuben, and it meant behold a son. I'm going to say behold the son. Red because the son is going to be the sacrifice. We run all the way to the last stone, the twelfth stone, and in that stone it ends with Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right hand. And we know that this is where Yeshua is, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is the Son, who is the, behold the Son, the sacrifice, the resurrected, exalted. And in the purity of the color, it is kind of like our diamond, but it, it exudes all. And I guess the diamond really exudes all the colors also, as you spin, as you turn it. But if you do spin a prism, it goes back to pure white. Mm -hmm. As it finally slows and breaks out, you see your colors. Mm -hmm. So in the purity and in the crowning glory of this color, we see the light, the light mm -hmm. that would shine forever. And it makes us remember Yeshua, Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 19. No more will the sun be your light by day, nor will moonlight shine on you. Instead, Adonai will be your light forever, mm -hmm. and your God, your glory. Mm -hmm. Do you remember verse 1 of that chapter? Arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord has come upon you. Mm -hmm. In chapter 9, it says that the people of Israel sat in darkness, but the light came. The light expelled the darkness. It's beautiful. I could stay here all night. <laughs> I'm moving on. We have the robe that the high priest wore. Blue. Again, heavenly. He is from heaven. He is our God. Wool. Though your sins are like, like a crimson, they will be white like wool. We see it coming into that um, prophetic uh, cleansing. They wore pomegranates. And they wore golden bells on the hand. And each had meaning. We could give, could give several different meanings for this. But I love that the pomegranates show us in the seeds. We have the seeds here in the word of God. And how satisfying and fulfilling the fruit of the spirit of our God. And the bells ring out the bells. Let the heavens declare. Let the earth rejoice. Let them all hear our God and mm -hmm. hear and see him in his work, atoning work for us. You wrap that up with the golden headband that was worn with the inscription in gold on his head, Kodesh, Kodesh la Adonai. Mm -hmm. Holy is the Lord. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that I'm beginning to get a beautiful picture. And then you remember that the Kohen Gadol would go into the Holy of Holies mm -hmm. once a year. But to get there, he went through three doors. Mm -hmm. He went through the, the surrounding, um, I don't, can't call it a curtain, but all the way around the temple, the tabernacle area, sorry. And then into the entrance to the holy building, but then in through the curtain to the Holy of Holies. Three entrances and you have I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. All these details, everything in the shape of the cross also is so rich, so much in this. But we see Yohanan John 14, 6 come alive in that. Because as they came into the way, they could not come in any direction, even though they were around. They had to come in through the way. Then they had to come in through the truth. The truth is what we find in that building that has the menorah, the light, that has all the, the furnishings of the tabernacle. But then to come into, I'm the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Mm -hmm. Life comes from what's inside the curtain. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Mm -hmm. What a plan. Mm -hmm. What detail. What architecture. And he's making a home for you. Mm. Mm. Wonder what it looks like. Mm. <laughs> sacrifices are to be made, and that's our next section in our parasha. All the detail of the sacrifices, and you can get bogged down here. 
their sacrifices of the bulls, of the goats, of the ram in detail, and they actually give a very special um, ceremony with the ram. It made it a peculiar ceremony, as my version gave it. It was a consecration offering, and it would be inducting the person into a consecrated office. And what we see is what the priests had to go through as they were being placed into position to be the priest, to represent God to the people, to represent the people to God. And of course, the highest of the, the priest is the high priest. But we have all of this expounded on. And as they were consecrated into this duty, it would be into specific directions that they had to follow in detail. But it also came with it privileges and enjoyments. They enjoyed different parts. It was not a labor. It was a joy to serve the Lord, and it had its reward in it. Read the, the parsha to get all the answers because I have to keep moving. I can't park on that. <laughs> but before, there would, they, the sprinkling of the blood on the altar, Moshe put on a haram and on his sons because originally a haram was the first high priest and his sons were the priests. So before the blood was put on the altar, he took some of that blood. You might not like this, but ask yourself, why? What's in the details? Mm -hmm. Some of that blood was put on the right ear, mm -hmm. on the right thumb, and on the right big toe. And because I have to hurry, I'll give it to you. The ear, the priests were to hear. They were to hearken to the word of God. They were to shema, constantly hear the word of God. They were to hear the commandments of God. They were to be able to bring that to the people. So with their hand, they needed to do their priestly functions, but in the proper way, as God directed. It wasn't just haphazard. They followed what God taught them. And the foot, the feet are easy. They need to walk according to what God was showing them. Walk according to carry out in the sanctuary what they were to do, where they were to go. Only the high priest went into that inner third door and only once a year. All of this in the detail. And when you see all of that and the blood mixed with the oil, you have the symbolism there, the divine grace of God. Because it's the Ruch HaKodesh, it's his spirit that is applying that blood. And you see how it was covering their whole soul, their whole being, that they were in the presence of their holy God. When they take the blood from the altar, it's even a picture of that soul that through that blood has found that atonement and has found that grace. And that's what the Spirit of God in you will reveal to you, that you are in His grace and you are cleansed, you are pure. So the sprinkling on the priests, it showed that they were 100% consecrated. All of them, the, their whole being, everything was all a part of this. It showed also that they were in an official position. So the people would recognize and say, this one is doing God's service. This one is doing for me. And those holy garments of the high priest, of Aharon's, Aaron's, were passed down to his sons. The first that we read of is in Benabar and Numbers, and we'll get there eventually, chapter 20, verses 26 to 28. Eliezer was the one who the robes were put on. God had an order, and it went to the one that God said was to be the high priest. We move on in our par, shall we come? We have to stop at the altar of incense. And this is where Tetzvah, where our section will close out, but it's interesting where it comes to close. In front of that veil that led into the Holy of Holies, that led to where the mercy seat was, that led to where the chariot beam were hovering over the glory of our God, the place that, that was filled with his glory, right outside of that veil, in front of it, would be uh, the altar that the burned incense. This was not the sacrificial altar that was outside. That was not in the building. This one was for prayer. This one was for the fragrance, the, the incense to be going up. And it was also perpetual, continual, 24 hours a day. When Aharon would come in in the morning to light the lamps, 
They were not out yet, and he was taught a way where one was continually burning while the others were filled up again, and then the one that continued to burn was taken care of. And by the way, the wicks were made out of the priest's garments when they wore out. Then they took them and made the wicks out of the priestly garments. Is that not beautiful also? Take the symbolism and run with it. But here, morning and night, when Aharon would be lighting or continuing the light, I should say, of the menorah, the incense would be added on. The incense would, would bring up a smoke that also, as the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, would help, in a sense, be a smoke screen so that the glory of God would not blind him in his humanness. But even more importantly, it was a constant sweet smell. It was to be a reminder that in God's nostrils, it says that our prayers are a sweet-smelling savor. Our praises are a sweet-smelling savor. That this is what's going up to our God. And they were told never to burn strange incense on this altar. It was only to be what God had directed. And it would not be the sacrificial blood. It would be the blood put on the altar once a year in purification mixed with this incense. That it wasn't to be the sacrifice itself. We see so much in the detail all the way through Tetzavah. I encourage you, read it and ask yourself, why that? What's it there for? What does that color mean? What did that motion mean? Because God will reveal answers to you. But I also have the great privilege of that Yeshua has given us not just our Torah, not just five books. He's given us 66. He's given us a book in the Brita Chadashah. I love it. I was going to say it's my favorite, but I'll say that about every book. <laughs> it's Hebrews, because it's to our people, and it's so needed for our people to understand. And you cannot study the tabernacle in Shmot in Exodus without studying it in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. If you do, you don't have all the detail. Mm -hmm. You don't have the whole picture. You don't get the complete picture. And let me just read to you, starting in chapter 8 with verse 1. Here is the whole point of what we've been saying. We do have just such a Kohen Gadol, a high yes. priest, mm -hmm. as has been described. He does sit at the right hand of the Hagadol, ha, 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 where is my Hebrew tonight? Abedon. Thank you. <laughs> in heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of Jehovah. He's sitting at the right hand of the one that we revere his holy name. There he serves in the holy place. That is in the true tent of meeting. The one erected not by human beings, but by Adonai. Mm. Do you catch that? Mm. As beautiful as the one on earth was. Mm. It was patterned after the heavenly. There is a real tabernacle. Mm. It is in the heavens, and you and I will see it when we go home to heaven. It is there. That is where our Kohen Gadol, our high priest, is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So this Kohen Gadol, too, has something that he can offer. What we're going to see as we go through this rapidly here is everything that was patterned after, there is a better, there's a better sacrifice, a better blood, there is a better priesthood, there is a better tabernacle, everything's better. If you want one word to sum up Hebrews, it's better. <laughs> better, 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 better. That's not better, it's better. <laughs> now, it says, our Kohen Gadol, has something he's offering on the better. If he were here on earth, he wouldn't be a Kohen at all, since there already are Kohenim offering gifts required by the Torah. But what they are serving is only a copy, only a shadow of the heavenly original. For when Moshe was about to erect the tent, the tabernacle, God warned him, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. Remember when he went up at the mountain 40 days up there and they said, I want to know what they talked about? <laughs> this is some of what the they details. talked about. Wow. Yes, the details. The details. 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 God it's was giving details. Moshe the details. 
But now the work Yeshua has been given to do is far superior to theirs, just as the covenant he mediates is better. For this covenant has been given as Torah on the basis of better promises. There's our key word. It's a better covenant. God says that I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's in Hebrews. But you know what? My little Jewish mind says, wait a minute. Long before I got to Hebrews, I heard these words. I read these words. My prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah gave me those very same words. And they're there. You can read it in chapter 31. If you're in the complete Jewish Bible, you start with verse 30. And if you're in, in New American or others, you start in verse 31. But open up Hebrews 8 and Jeremiah 31. Mm. It's one book, folks. It's one story. It is his story. It's all pointing. What's our focal point? Yeshua. Remember last week? It's Yeshua. It's all about Yeshua. It's all focusing on him. Chapter 9 in the book of Hebrews mentions the very same articles I've taken you through tonight. The very same things are mentioned here. Verse 8 says, By this arrangement the Ruach HaKodesh showed that so long as the first tent had, was standing, the way into the holiest place was still closed. Not everyone could go into the holiest place. Only the high priest, only once a year, only the way God said. But verse 11 and 12 says, But when Messiah appeared as Kohen Gadol, at the good things that are happening already, then through the greater and the more perfect tent, which is not man-made, that is, it's not of this created world, he entered the holiest place once and for all. He entered not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus setting people free. Amen. How long, Janet? Forever. Forever. That's eternal redemption. Amen. That doesn't start and stop. That flows forever. And verse 22b tells us why. It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But verse 25 says, further, he did not enter heaven to offer himself over and over again. He doesn't do this every year. Like the Kohen Haggadol, who enters the holiest place year after year with blood that's not his own. That's what he had to do. But the end of verse 26 says, but as it is, he appeared once at the end of the ages. He appeared in order to do away with sin through the sacrifice of himself. Amen. And I say, hallelujah. Amen. It's done. It's finished. Remember a couple weeks back we looked at that, but his words on the cross, it was finished. It was done. It was complete. Messiah offered once to bear the sins of many. Verse 28. Hebrews, you're all over my Jewish scriptures. You take from my prophets and you bring it home and you show it in the glory because it's from the heavens. When we finish off our parsha with the, this perpetual incense that's going on before the Lord, it's interesting that they refer to the Ark of Testimony. That's the, the Ark that's in the holiest place. That I found it interesting that they use the word testimony there. Mm -hmm. You know, where do we get off the testimony? Martyr. Mm -hmm. Our martyrs mm -hmm. give testimony. Mm -hmm. What do the martyrs do? They shed their blood mm -hmm. for the truth. Mm -hmm. This is what opened the pathway. Not to the holy of holies on earth. This is what opened the pathway to the holy of holies in heaven. Amen. Wow. Amen. And that's where our prayers go. They don't go into the tent on earth. They go into the throne room. They go into the presence of our God. What a gift. God is in the details. No. Every descriptive word, every picture, every phrase, every article, every instrument, everything is revealing some part of an aspect of his work, his relationship, who he is, what he's doing, and that is all to bring us into the presence mm -hmm. of our God to see that tabernacle one day. Wow.
You know, in our relationship, in our scriptures, and what we are learning, there is nothing hidden. Mm -hmm. I think almost every false religion has hidden things. Mm -hmm. You have to be of a certain sect. You have to raise to this level. You have to come behind these closed doors. There's always something hidden. Mm -hmm. But our God throws open the doors. He brings out the light and he shines it. Mm -hmm. And he says, no hidden secrets here. Mm -hmm. Nothing mm -hmm. hidden. Mm -hmm. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. And I'm reminded of Tehillim, Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. This psalm is speaking of God healing Jerusalem. God healing Israel. Oh, I can't wait to see that. But just before it, we're drawn back into the heavens. Just like Psalm 19. Just before it, we're drawn back into the heavens. We're drawn back to where that mercy seat is. We're drawn to where our prayers come up. We're drawn right into the throne room. We are drawn to where our, the sweet-smelling savor has come up. And that is where it is. It's passed through his creativity. It's passed through his heavens. It's passed through the sun, through the planets, through the stars, through those mm. universes that are just hanging out there giving glory to God. It's passed all of that. And it's gone into his heaven, into his tabernacle, into his throne room. And why it makes me think of this psalm is because verse 4 says, he counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. We talked about that before, but I'm going to bring you out something else. That's my God. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Mm -hmm. You know what this means? Mm -hmm. I always took it that, that he, you know, it goes beyond everything. He understands it all, but it's not. It can be that also, but there's more meaning here. Let me back up and says that first it's telling us he's numbered the stars. Mm -hmm. That tells us he can number. He numbered them. He created them. He numbered them. He knows how many. He knows their names. He knows everything about each and every star. He called them into, creative, into being by his creative power. And he created the number that pleased him. Now, ask me that number. I have no clue. <laughs> but he knows. He knows the number and he knows the names. That's what the first part of the verse says. And then it's brought home because we begin to see and understand from other scriptures that God is telling us he knows the number of exiles. He knows the number of those who went into captivity in Jeremiah's day. We've drawn from his scripture. In Isaiah's day, we drew from there. And it he, as he spoke to my heart, he said, I know the number of hostages mm. in Gaza. Mm. I know each one. Mm. That's where we begin to see that he is acquainted with human woe, mm. with human grief, that nothing is too small to matter to him. Mm. He doesn't miss a detail. Mm. He knows the number of hairs on my head, and it changed tonight when I brushed my hair. <laughs> when you see those two in relation, then you begin to understand that he allots a number to the stars. To man, it's innumerable. We can't figure it out. But he is saying, I'm omniscient. I know it all. And even though I'm omniscient, I am the Almighty One, so that I know each individual, and I know each name. I know your cares and your worries. I know what's tripping you up. And I've got to ask you, why? Because I'm infinite. I have that power. That's what he's saying in that. Not that it's an infinite number, but that he is the infinite one. Yes. There is nothing beyond him. Mm -hmm. There's nothing missed to us. We look at the stars, and even though we can see the constellations and all, really it's a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And that's where I told Marie, that's what the Lord showed me, it's a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And it can be entangled in our minds. We may be able to navigate and learn some, but 
We can't map the stars. Mm -hmm. We can't tell about the black holes on one side and what's on the other side. We know we're limited in our knowledge. Mm -hmm. But God is showing us. I patterned them. Mm -hmm. I created them in an order. I created them. I laid them mm -hmm. out. I counted them. And I accounted for them. And I care for them. And if he did that for the stars, mm -hmm. What do you think he's doing for you? What is he doing for me? This is where we're to bring it home. How great is our God? And yet he's not so far out there that he doesn't know. He's where the rubber meets the road. And I guarantee you that I've seen it, felt it, lived it in my life. And I can guarantee you he knows where you're at this very moment. Mm -hmm. He knows what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think, thank you, God, you are in the details. And you do know the details. And this is one time I'm saying it is good to be bogged down in the details. <laughs> because this is where God wants us. He said, I created you. I numbered you. I numbered your days. I created you when you would be born and when you will leave this earth. Mm -hmm. It's not by accident, even though some think it is. Mm -hmm. It is divinely yep. orchestrated. And this must be really hitting Jim and Diane with the mm -hmm. home going of their beloved. He ordained that day. Yes. Why it wasn't the day before yes. or the day after, God alone knows. Mm -hmm. But if God's ordaining our days, what's he doing in between in the dash, mm -hmm. between our numbers? Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. I want to be in the detail of your life. And I created you mm -hmm. to know me. Mm -hmm. And when you come to know me, when you have opened your heart, received Messiah in, his shed blood in your place because there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood and no one is guiltless no one if they even say they are that they've never sinned they're, they've got the sin of pride all over them. <laughs> but as soon as the lord has come in he says now i've consecrated you i put my robe on you remember they wore certain robes and it had blood on it. They were consecrated. Mm -hmm. We put on the robe of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And it is pure white, but it's stained with his blood. We're in his robe because we are in his service. We're told by Kepha, 1 Peter, Kepha, mm -hmm. chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that we are a chosen people. Mm -hmm. The king's, Kohanim, the king's priests, were a royal priesthood. You're in the service of the king. And by the way, God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. So if he's the king, you're a prince or you're a princess. You're not down here somewhere. You're in a high position. You, as he spoke to our people, he said, you're a holy nation, a people for God to possess. His own. He possesses us for his possessions in order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you, here it is, out of darkness and into the wonderful light. And there's our menorah. This is what it's all about. We're in his light. Bask in his light and let him hear your praises because that's what he says. He made us for once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Before you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. You're in his robe. He said in Yeshua, Isaiah 64, that our righteousness, filthy rags. Well, guess what? Get rid of your rags. Put on the riches because you're putting on, or he puts on you. Just as the priests were dressed, especially the high priest, had those who, who helped him, he puts on his robe of righteousness for us. What a contrast between Isaiah 64 and back up to 61 where we're seeing that light, where we're seeing that uh, consecration, where we're seeing what he's brought to us. And then he has chosen to put his blood on your ear and your thumb and your foot too. 
because as a priest, you need to be hearing his word, obedient to his word, so that you carry out by your hands and your feet taking you wherever he leads you. It might be around the corner, it might be to the next bedroom, and it might be around the world. But you are his, and he's ordained you for a purpose. When you are in need, and we all have our needs, Bruce started off earlier saying he's the God of the possible, and he's the God of the impossible, making the impossible possible. When you want, and this is any time you want, I love, even though he's king, you don't wait for a special invitation. You don't have a certain time, and you learn to bow just right, and you learn what you can say and what you can't say, and you have your moment. We're even going to do one night with the king. Mm -hmm. But it's not just one night. Any time you want, he says, no. come into my throne room. Come into my throne room. Come in to let me help you in your time of need. Come by the way of the altar. Yes, come by the way of the altar of the sacrifice. Proceed past the altar sacrifice to the altar of incense, your fragrant prayers. So come up as you come up. Come past that altar of incense. Come through the veil. He doesn't have any secrets, and he doesn't hold us back. And you know what he did with that veil? He tore it open. He tore it open from the top to the bottom, and he pinned it back with two nails. So then you can go right through in his very presence. Come past the altar of sacrifice. Come past the altar of incense. Come through the veil. And come right to the mercy seat. See the blood that was placed there for you. Do you know we'll see Yeshua's earthly blood on that mercy seat forever? Mm -hmm. always reminding us mm -hmm. of what he's done for us. Mm -hmm. We come by way of the cross. Mm -hmm. I am the way. Mm -hmm. I am the truth. Yeah. I am the life. And Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore let us confidently mm -hmm. approach the throne mm -hmm. from which God gives grace, mm -hmm. so that we may receive mercy mm -hmm. and find grace in our time of need. Mm -hmm. It's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. We're still looking at our focal point. It's all about Yeshua. It's all about his love. Mm -hmm. It's all about the cross, the sacrifice. It's all about coming home. It's all about being in his presence, mm -hmm. crying out, and he gives <coughs> us his grace, and his mercy. And we're told they're new every morning. Mm -hmm. They never run out. God is in the details. <laughs> Let him into the details of your life. Quit trying to do it yourself. If you've never opened the door for him to come in, I'm going to close in prayer and give you that opportunity. And it's no magic words or magic formula. God sees your heart. And he says, I want to write this on your heart. I want to have it inside. I want to consecrate you. I want to dress you beautiful. I want to dress you in righteous robes. I want you to come right into my presence. I want you to come any time you want. Any reason. Bring your needs. But I'm also going to say, bring your praises. Bring your praise. Because what a God. What love that will not let me go. Let's call some prayer. Our precious, our holy, Mashiach, Messiah, and Savior, how we thank you. You placed your sinless blood on the altar, on the mercy seat in heaven. You opened the way for us to come into your very presence, to flood us now with your spirit and bring us home one day to see that we're in your tabernacle forever. Lord, I pray for any in this room who have never opened that door, who have not started on that pathway home. Lord, may they open up their heart right now. May they just simply say, yes, I want what she's saying. Please come in. Cleanse me of my sin. Be my Savior. 
and be my way. Point the way home for me, Lord, that I can come into your presence one day. And we who know this and have asked you in, we shout our praises, our hallelujahs, our thank yous, that we know, that we know, that we know that that veil was torn open for us and that we can and we are right there in your throne room. We know that we are there always, Lord, before you, receiving from you your grace and your mercy, and we can never thank you enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, thank you. You are in the details of our lives for everyone in their needs at this very moment. Thank you that you know it, that we don't need to tell you what's going on. We just need to simply come, put it at your feet, let you take it, mold it, and make it so that it's something beautiful that brings us closer to you, and more shining like you. Oh, Lord, let us see. Even our trials and our tribulations are to bring us closer to you. Praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah. What a God. How great you are. Mm -hmm. And we all say amen. 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 Amen